So welcome to our lecture series in summer 2021 at the Mon Monday Colloquium of the Deutsches Museum, which we have organized and will hold for this semester together with cooperation partners. The lecture series is titled Thinking Machines, History, Present and Future of AI, or in German, uh, Maschinendenken, Geschichte, Gegenwart und Zukunft der Künstlichen Intelligenz. The cooperation partners are the European School a new school of digital studies with uh, Jan Hendrik Passert, who has held the professorship of sociology of technology there since last year, and the philosophy of computing group at the Warsaw University of Technology with Hajo Greif, who is a research assistant professor there. I'm Rudolf Seising, and I'm leading a, his a science history project at the Deutsches Museum on the history of AI in Germany. And our speaker today is Shannon Waller, and with that I give uh, the floor to Hajo Greif. Yeah. Shalafni Panstvo, vitame na nashim ciklu vikwadov o historii i filozofii i sociologii stuchni inteligenci. Nazivam se Hajo Greif, jestem filozofem na Politechnici Vashaskiri. I'll switch to English now. So, the idea to a series was born when like the three of us, um, Rudolf, um, Jan, and I were still all based in Munich. And we started talking about uh, doing some kind of interdisciplinary series that um, develops some kind of integrated perspective um, on, well, the history, a present and future of um, artificial intelligence. Originally, we planned to do this as a live lecture series in Munich um, until, you know, uh, all what intervened. Um, and we postponed it and then we moved the whole thing online. Um, in the meantime, uh, we moved to different places. So actually it was quite handy to have, have this online format because uh, uh, otherwise we all would have uh, to go to Munich um, to attend our own lectures. So um, back then we developed um, the concept, invited some speakers um, who are all still with us today. So we kept the, kept the program intact, but just changed the format and the timing. So this is where we are now. Um, and with that, I hand over to Jan. Yes, <clears throat> welcome from, from me too. My name is Jan Passwort. I'm, uh, as Rudi already said, professor at the European New School for, of Digital Studies. Um, I am just giving you some uh, background on uh, the, the previous uh, talks. You can find them uh, probably now all of them, uh, the two of them on the Deutsches Museum YouTube uh, page uh, in recording if you have missed them. Uh, and um, uh, the next uh, weeks we will after Shannon's talk uh, also have a nice um, extended lineup uh, coming up um, the next uh, one uh, at the end of May Monday uh, the 31st of May will be the only one we will uh, hold in English uh, hold in German which is the talk by Wolfgang Bibel uh, on the development of AI in, in Germany then we will have Harry Collins Vincent Muller and we end up our discussion in July with uh, a small panel discussion on algorithms, trust and regulation with Virginia Dignam, Christian Kerstig and Matthias Spielkamp. Um, it uh, was supposed to be in the Deutsches Museum Ehrensaal. Probably uh, we will also hold it, uh, even if the COVID situation um, um, opens up, uh, we will probably also hold it uh, online um, in the coming weeks. So um, just to give you some information of how we are running these uh, series, if you um, have any question, any comment, any remark already during the talk of uh, Shannon Vella today, uh, please drop them into the Q&A function that you can uh, probably all see. Uh, we can then uh, sort them and uh, take them in uh, for discussion and we will um, do this uh, iterating later on. Uh, so if you are uh, raising your hand, we can take you in and give you audio speaking rights. Uh, but we will also ask the, the ones who um, enter questions in the Q&A to utter their own questions if they want so. Otherwise, we can also read them uh, to Shannon uh, afterwards. So um, feel free to also drop in questions while the talk is going on so that we are um, easily prepared for starting the discussions um, and right after it. So with this, I uh, give back to Hayo to introduce our today's speaker. Mute myself. So here we are again. Um, yes, this is supposed. 
<laughs> how it's supposed to look. So please let me introduce um, to you uh, today's speaker, Shannon Beller. Um, and now I'm what, yes, this is how it works. Um, Okay, Sean Valor is a ba Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence, uh, which is hosted by the Edinburgh Futures Institute at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, Sean holds a PhD in philosophy from Boston College from 2001 and has been a professor at, um, through different stages of her career um, at Santa Clara University in California from I think 2003 um, or 2006 to 2020 before moving um, to Edinburgh to this very prestigious position at the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which is um, quite an inter and transdisciplinary affair um, and um, where she's holding this position for I think a year now. Um, so to name some of Shannon's achievements. She holds the World Technology Award in Ethics for her first book. Um, it was awarded in 2015. Um, from her former home university, she received the Public Intellectual Award and President Special Recognition Award in 2017 both. Um, Shannon has also been uh, the president of the Society for Philosophy, of, of, uh, Philosophy and Technology and she has uh, been a uh, visiting researcher in AI ethics at Google. So that's just some of her achievements. There are numerous more, uh, but I don't want to take too much time here. So some of her publications, um, I'm mentioning by name only her books. Um, from 2016, we have her first monograph, um, Technology and the Virtues, A Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting with Oxford University Press. Then there's two books in the making. One um, is a monograph again, The AI Mirror, Rebuilding Human Wisdom in the Age of Automated Thinking. I expect this talk to uh, present, uh, today's talk to present some of the content of that book in particular. Um, and then she's uh, um, editing the Oxford Handbook of Philosophy of Technology, which is also forthcoming. It's supposed to be out this year. Apart from that, Ashan has 26, probably more peer reviewed articles and book chapters. So, and here's some very rough outline of, of what Shannon's work is, is about content wise. Um, so she inquires into the impact of emerging technologies on human moral and intellectual character, where her approach is one of virtue ethics, which um, contrasts, um, I think, quite nicely with uh, the dominant strands of uh, AI th ethics that we th that we see our days, which are mostly utilitarian, consequentialist. Um, we will hear about a very different approach today, I'm sure. Um, and her aim is um, that's from the promotional text of her 2016 book to. Um, to come to a deliberate cultivation of technomoral virtues adapted to the unique challenges of 21st century life that offer the human family our best chance of learning to live wisely and well with emerging technologies, end quote. Um, and with these words um, by Shannon on Shannon, I'll um, stop here and hand over the presentation um, to Shannon herself. So um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hajo. And uh, thank you uh, uh, to Hajo and Rudy and Jan for inviting me here today. Uh, thank you all for, uh, uh, for joining us. And I'm looking forward to a good conversation. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, and thank you in particular for that uh, extremely uh, lovely and, and generous introduction. I think that was the uh, kindest introduction I've, I've had. So uh, that was, uh, that was an unexpected surprise, but uh, very, very, very lovely. Um, all right, so hopefully uh, everyone can see my screen. Does that look okay? Great. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, what I'm calling uh, the digital uh, basanos. And what I mean by that will become clear in a moment. But what this talk is really about uh, is the relationship between AI, uh, truth, and violence. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, interested to see what you have to say about the ideas which are intended to be uh, provocative here. So, um, 
The basanos is a Greek word uh, which refers to something that is often translated as the torture stone, um, but it has a, a broader meaning. So let me take you through some of the history of uh, this particular concept. So in antiquity, basanite stone was used to test the authenticity of substances uh, uh, asserted to be gold. So uh, if you struck uh, a purported uh, gold substance on uh, the basanite stone, it would leave behind a distinctive mark if it was true gold. Now, uh, this practice uh, later uh, generated a, a broader meaning of the concept uh, of the basanos, uh, where it came to refer to any rigorous test or examination which extracts a confession of truth, uh, especially by means of torture. So uh, the initial concept, right, is uh, the extraction of the truth of a substance, uh, uh, specifically gold, uh, by striking it uh, upon this stone. Uh, but later then it becomes a reference to the extraction of truth by a certain kind of violence or threat of violence against persons. Aristotle describes the use uh, of basanos as testimony, uh, i.e. specifically the physical torture of a slave uh, in a legal context in order to uh, extract truth about his master. Uh, the idea being here that one could not trust a slave to speak truly about his master's uh, deeds, uh, given that his master could certainly punish him for speaking said truth. Uh, so uh, some means of, of physical uh, uh, motivation in the form of torture uh, had to be used in order to overcome this fear of the slave uh, and compel uh, the truth uh, of the testimony uh, they might give about uh, their master, where the master is presumably uh, the one whose actions are under examination. Uh, but it, it is used also uh, uh, well after Greek antiquity. Uh, uh, for example, in Matthew 18, 34, uh, there's a reference uh, in anger, his master handed him over uh, to the basanastai, the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. So, I want to dive into the way this concept uh, is discussed by Aristotle specifically. Uh, so in the rhetoric, Aristotle says this. He says, as for proofs of truth, some are technical, uh, and here we're referring to uh, techne or craft, and others are atechnical. By the latter, he says, I mean all those which have not been furnished by ourselves, but were already in existence such as witnesses, tortures, and here the word is basanoi, contracts and the like. He goes on to say that by the former, uh, uh, we are talking about all that can be uh, constructed by system and by our own efforts. So we only have to make use of the latter, whereas we must invent the former. Okay, so to clarify then, Natural proofs, proofs that are already in existence in the world and merely need to be used rather than constructed, are things like witnesses. There's already a witness. The witness has already seen what they have seen. They already hold this truth. We just need to use the witness uh, to understand uh, uh, what is true. Uh, and the same uh, is uh, true in a contract. The document itself says uh, uh, what, what has happened, what has been agreed. And so we just have to use that contract uh, in order to understand uh, the truth. And Aristotle's claiming that the same is true of torture, uh, specifically the torture of slaves. Their truth is already there. We just need to use it. And this is uh, to be uh, contrasted with logical proofs, uh, which have to be constructed by our own efforts, where the truth is not already uh, in front of us, but we need to construct a logical edifice in order to expose it or access it. Okay. So here's the distinction that he's making. So in the Basanos, a reliable link is asserted between truth, oops, sorry. Sorry. Uh, in the Basanos, a reliable link is asserted between truth and violence. And yet Aristotle chooses not to frame torture 
as an invention or craft. He does not frame it as a technique. He identifies it as a technical. And this is in contrast to logos, which must be skillfully devised by the technique of rhetoric. So instead, Bosonos is classified by Aristotle as this unmediated natural extraction of truth from the body and not just anyone's body, but the body of a slave. What I wanna show in this talk is how this oppressive legacy of framing truth as a natural, unconstructed extraction by violence has seeped into the way that we build, use, and talk about artificial intelligence. And again, I said that the thesis would be provocative. I also wanna think about new ways forward, ways to break the violent legacy of the Basanos and reimagine virtuous modes and technologies of truth telling. So let's dive deeper into this notion uh, of torture as a path to truth. Uh, one of the uh, uh, definitive works on this topic is Paige Dubois' uh, book, Torture and Truth from 1991. Uh, she lays out here uh, her, uh, her project. She wants to show how the logic of our philosophical tradition, of some of our inherited beliefs about truth, leads almost inevitably to conceiving of the body of the other as the site from which truth can be produced, and to using violence if necessary to extract that truth. She goes on to point out that before the fifth century BCE, the word bastanos appears in the work of aristocratic poets who use it to suggest the necessity for methods of proof of loyalty in a world in which noble dominance is being threatened, in which the secure place of the descendants of Homeric heroes can no longer be taken for granted. So I want to point out that uh, here, the Bosnos is not merely about truth and violence, it's also about power, uh, and it's also about hierarchy. Um, the uh, Bosnos is used by the powerful against uh, the enslaved or the powerless. Um, and it's used as a way to test uh, the authenticity uh, of, uh, of a claim uh, made by the powerless. There's uh, also an interesting discussion of uh, the Bassanos in uh, Bernard Harcourt's uh, book, The Counter Revolution from 2018, in the chapter on governing through a terror. Uh, so he talks here about uh, um, uh, techniques of uh, intelligence and uh, counterintelligence. And he says, there is oddly an uncanny similitude between the actual operation of the Basanos, the tool itself, and the operation of torture. With the tool, the Lydian stone, one rubs gold against the slate, physically ripping pieces off of the gold to see the color of the mark made and left on the slate. Physical torture, it seems, mimics that act. It is a rubbing of the physical body against all kinds of tools. In ancient times, the rack or water. Still today, the wall slam, the slap, the water board, the electrical charge, in order to see the truth. The metaphor of scraping the body, like one scrapes gold, to see the residue of truth is haunting. And what I want to suggest is that today, we have a new way of scraping the body. And that new form of torture, that new form of extraction from the body of unconsented truth uh, is uh, being mediated by the tools of artificial intelligence. So the next section is about uh, the AI bosanos. So if we think about AI as a digital uh, bosanos, uh, what we can think about are the kinds of truths that AI is routinely being designed today to extract from the body, and particularly to extract from the body of persons uh, who have not uh, consented to, or in many cases will not even know uh, that these truths uh, are being extracted or claimed to be extracted from their bodies. Uh, when I talk about extraction from the body, uh, I'm thinking about various uh, modes of uh, facial uh, analysis and facial recognition, uh, gait analysis, uh, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, voice analysis for sentiment and other traits. Uh, there's uh, virtually no aspect of the body uh, that uh, people aren't currently developing AI applications uh, to uh, scan, analyze, uh, classify, uh, predict, and extract uh, truths, or as they're called today, insights from. 
So the kinds of truths uh, that AI is uh, uh, most commonly designed to extract from the body, uh, the truth of one's identity, right? So a facial recognition algorithm that uh, specifies what unique person you are, uh, your gender, your ethnicity, your religion. Uh, for example, uh, there uh, is considerable evidence uh, that the People Re People's Republic of China uh, have been using uh, AI systems uh, to identify Uyghur uh, Muslims uh, uh, in uh, the community. Uh, age, sexual orientation, uh, sentiment or emotional states, uh, intentions. So we have tools uh, that are being used by retailers to try to determine uh, whether the object you're looking at on the shelf is one that you are about uh, to put in your shopping cart uh, or hide in your bag and steal. Uh, attentional state and target. Uh, so we have AI systems that uh, claim to be able to determine what you're looking at, what you're paying attention to, and even what your attitude toward that object or subject is. Uh, and even uh, to extract uh, truths about your personality traits uh, or even your uh, predisposition to criminality. Uh, now, it's going to become obvious in what I have to say that many of these claims uh, uh, go beyond the dubious to uh, the, uh, the patently uh, false. But nevertheless, uh, these uh, claims are uh, increasingly uh, used uh, to uh, articulate the potential power uh, of AI as a digital basanos, as a, a digital extractor of truth from the bodies of persons. So uh, let me just give you a few examples. So here we have uh, a Wired article from 2020, uh, which is promoting research uh, that at the time uh, was just in preprint form on uh, gate-based emotion learning. Uh, uh, and this is a, an application that is proposed for socially aware robot navigation. I'll talk more about this in a moment. Uh, but the idea is uh, that uh, this system can look at you, uh, uh, watch you walk, uh, analyze that walk and determine from your walk or gait uh, what uh, emotional state you are in, whether you are happy, sad, angry, or in a neutral mood. Now, what's interesting is that if you look at the paper itself, uh, and I've got a link here uh, from the pre to the preprint, there's no mention in the paper of the social or ethical implications of this research, uh, no mention of uh, its associated risks of abuse or harm to people, um, particularly from dual use potential. Um, that is, it's designed to be used uh, purportedly to allow uh, robots uh, to determine whether pedestrians in their path are in a bad mood and therefore to give them extra space if they are in a bad mood. Now, I might be cynical, but I, it's hard for me to imagine that there's a massive business case for this particular application. I can think of many more things and many more users uh, uh, that would want this technology if it worked in order uh, to detect uh, the emotional state of people from their gate. I doubt that robot nav socially aware robot navigation is really going to be the primary use. Uh, so there's a considerable dual use uh, potential here. Imagine, for example, the interest that governments would have in uh, monitoring crowds uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a political rally or a protest uh, to try to see who in the crowd might be angry. Uh, the potential bias risks of this technology are not uh, discussed, uh, despite the fact that we have uh, considerable evidence uh, that uh, would suggest that there's likely to be uh, um, uh, racial, gender, uh, uh, and cultural, uh, possibly age bias as well uh, in this uh, particular uh, kind of application. And no mention in the research of the value uh, laden choices and assumptions of the designers. Like many of the examples uh, that will follow, uh, these omissions by the researchers uh, convey an ironic and yet dangerously compelling illusion. Uh, they compel the, uh, uh, convey the illusion of a natural or atechnic extraction of unconsented emotional truth from the subject's body, which has been virtually rubbed against the touchstone of the algorithm. And we hear this uh, kind of illusion often framed uh, in the dangerous AI rhetoric uh, that math doesn't lie or data doesn't lie. Uh, we know, of course, um, uh, that uh, data are labeled by humans, are uh, curated and selected by humans, are interpreted by humans uh, in ways uh, that allow uh, systems such as this 
to suffer from any number of kinds of false positives and false negatives that are often conditioned uh, uh, by unfair social biases. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the research is presented without any of that context. And we are invited to think of it as a, a tool that can reach into virtually the body of people and extract the truth of their emotional states. Now, what's interesting about this is that this kind of research is routinely rebunk, uh, debunked and not just debunked by ethicists, but debunked by other uh, uh, machine learning and AI researchers. Uh, here is just an example of um, uh, Tim O'Brien from uh, Microsoft Research, uh, who has only one thing uh, to say about this particular study. Uh, he says, just absolute nonsense, garbage tech. Um, and this is just a single example of, uh, of, of many responses to research like this from machine learning researchers um, who point out uh, both its ethical flaws and its technical and scientific uh, 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 questionability. But it doesn't stop this research from, from uh, continuing to be generated and promoted, which is why uh, I call it zombie AI. Uh, it's research that isn't very well put together, uh, so you can knock it down easily. Uh, and, and researchers uh, routinely do this for two reasons. Uh, to fight against harmful AI and the unjust systems that produce it, uh, but also to project uh, to protect legitimate uses of AI from being tarnished and therefore uh, AI adoption being suppressed by its association with unethical and or unscientific applications. So if you're uh, promoting AI uh, and you want it to succeed, you might very well want to criticize research like this uh, because it carries the risk of, of tainting legitimate applications of, uh, of AI science uh, and, uh, uh, and, um, and tools uh, with, uh, with the, the problems of, of this kind of zombie research. But these studies keep coming back in ever new forms and waves, even as they lead to paper retractions, peer rejection, and often career embarrassment. And so it's worth asking why. What, what is the motivation behind the zombies? Why do they keep getting up and coming back? So uh, as I've uh, indicated already, uh, many of these uh, uh, zombies are also racist. Uh, that is uh, the uh, AI uh, facial recognition platforms and gate recognition platforms uh, are often trained on data uh, that is rife uh, with various forms of unfair social bias, uh, racial bias being just uh, uh, one of the more common examples. Uh, so here is uh, 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 a analysis of emotion reading uh, uh, claims uh, by facial recognition tools. Uh, so Lauren Rue in 2018 showed uh, that uh, even when you have images that are taken in the same format by the same camera, uh, so here she used a data set uh, involving player photos from a basketball league, uh, she showed that multiple uh, facial recognition uh, platforms, uh, including uh, Microsoft's AI and Face++, as well as others, uh, were uh, assigning uh, black smiling faces more negative emotions than similar expressions on white faces. So Microsoft's AI at the time was three times more likely to classify uh, black players' emotion as contempt in photos which were ambiguous, and Face++ uh, plus plus was consistently rating black player emotion as two times more likely to be angry, three times more likely to be fear, and 20% less happy, even when controlling for objective smile degree. So when you have the same sort of curvature uh, of the smile. Uh, other examples uh, of, uh, uh, of these kinds of biases are, should be familiar uh, to many of you. Uh, so there's uh, considerable evidence about uh, the use of uh, uh, predictive tools by uh, police departments around the world. Uh, I'll focus here on uh, the United States as an example. Uh, MIT uh, uh, Technology Review uh, looked at um, research by uh, NYU's uh, AI Now, which found uh, that there was systematic use of what they call dirty data to train predictive policing AI. Uh, they found that nine of 13 precincts were using demonstrably biased or dirty data sources. Uh, they found no evidence that AI vendors were independently validating the policing data they were using to train the systems. And they found few, if any, efforts by police departments or predictive uh, system vendors to assess or mitigate the dirty data problem. 
uh, many scholars, uh, Ruha Benjamin, uh, Tumek Ebru, others have talked about uh, particularly the, the uh, effect of, of racial and gender and other intersectional biases uh, on the performance of these systems. And in fact, many uh, police agencies have had uh, to, uh, uh, to discontinue some of the predictive uh, policing initiatives uh, using AI that they had launched uh, because of poor performance and biased performance. Uh, so the digital Basanos is not just a commercial tool, but one increasingly being used uh, as a form of state power. Uh, we also need to talk about the phrenologist zombies. So uh, this is a, a, a class of uh, AI research claims uh, that attempt uh, to infer personality traits, uh, uh, typically from facial images. Here is a study from Hashimi uh, and Hall uh, uh, from uh, 2020 uh, that was uh, claiming a test accuracy of 97% uh, uh, at uh, criminal tendency detection from facial images. This research, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, would be, was uh, rapidly debunked by scholars uh, from IEEE. Uh, I have the reference here on the lower left who noted that the training data in the study were rife with confounding variables. For example, unlike the non-criminal images uh, that were used to train the tool, all the criminal images uh, were mugshots from the same image format and camera type. So in fact, the researchers didn't build a, a criminality detector at all, they built a mugshot detector. They also, uh, I will note, uh, uh, remark uh, that their study was triggered uh, by a research uh, uh, by Lombroso, uh, and they don't uh, provide any context to indicate that Lombroso's research uh, was uh, roundly uh, 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 debunked uh, as unscientific uh, uh, race science that uh, and phrenology uh, that uh, is based on uh, inadequate scientific foundations as well as uh, morally problematic foundations. Um, and this is just one example. Uh, the uh, zombies, uh, as we say, just keep coming. So this is a study uh, from Harrisburg University um, uh, that uh, had to have their own uh, communications department retract their glowing press release due to the immediate firestorm of rebuke by prominent scientists of the irresponsibility of this study. Again, uh, like the Hashimi and Hall study, uh, claiming to predict criminality. Um, now the researchers have promised to release their research once they have addressed these concerns. Uh, I am not aware of, of that having happened. Uh, we have a study uh, that was released uh, recently by Nature Communications uh, that claimed to be able to use uh, a, a machine learning analysis of facial cues and paintings to uh, measure trustworthiness. Um, the BCS Lovelace Medal winner and uh, pioneering software engineer Grady Booch tweeted of the study. He said, the paper is an epic failure on every level, assumptions, process, data science, and ethical foundations, bad science all around. Uh, one of the lead researchers on the study uh, uh, tweeted uh, about it, uh, which sparked an, expensive, an extensive debate on Twitter about whether the study was actual phrenology or merely uh, phrenology adjacent. Uh, soon thereafter, he del deleted his uh, Twitter account. Uh, and again, this is uh, um, a screenshot of the tweet uh, that claimed uh, that they had designed an algorithm to automatically generate trust trustworthiness evaluations uh, for the facial action units. And if you see this diagram from the study, uh, identifying uh, facial features uh, that indicate trustworthiness and uh, facial features that uh, indicate a lack of trustworthiness Again, um, this is pretty much uh, 19th century and uh, early 20th century phrenology just dressed up in AI form. But again, it's uh, an attempt to build a digital basanos uh, to extract uh, unconsented from the body uh, truths uh, about this person's uh, behavior and uh, intentions. Um, now, uh, this study uh, had uh, originally claimed that it was uh, simply uh, intending to show how people judge trustworthiness from looking at faces, as opposed to making an objective claim about the trustworthiness of persons. Um, and yet, uh, this did not stop uh, uh, Beaumard and his co-author from contributing to an article in The Sun tabloid in, on September 29th of last year, 
in which their algorithm was used to rate the trustworthiness of 11 celebrities and politicians. Here's a quote from the Sun article. Reality veteran Kim Kardashian has been awarded top marks in a study conducted by the Sun, again, with the help of these researchers, that rates trustworthiness, with experts saying her face shows her to be truly dependable, according to the algorithm which rates apparent trustworthiness they developed. In general, the scientists have previously explained that females appear less dominant and more maternal, which makes them more trustworthy. Okay, so these are the kinds of claims uh, that we are having uh, to deal with again and again in the form of these zombie AI research studies. Uh, by the way, I see a new one of these every week. Um, and myself and, and any number of responsible uh, uh, AI researchers and AI ethicists online are constantly debunking these uh, week to week to week. So why do they keep coming? What is the motivation behind this is the question that I'm asking. So I think it's part of this legacy of violence that AI has been incorporated into. Uh, it's a way of uh, recognizing that AI does not uh, uh, emerge in a vacuum, that it is not uh, uh, entirely new, that it is part uh, of a long historical legacy and one that I started this talk reflecting on, uh, the desire to build uh, uh, a, uh, a claim, um, which is a technology but claims not to be technical, which claims not to be an invention, which claims to be a natural extraction of truth from bodies without their consent. Uh, and so I think uh, we need to remember uh, Faulkner's uh, uh, words that the past uh, is, not, uh, is, not, is never dead. And in fact, uh, it's not even past. Or as it's said more directly by P.T. Anderson uh, in the script for the film Magnolia, uh, we may be through with the past, but the past isn't through with us. So I don't think the past is through uh, with AI. I think there's a legacy of, uh, of violence that has been embedded in it. Um, and if you think uh, that I'm uh, overstating things by talking about violence, um, I, I want you to, to think about a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we're talking about in the AI field an irrepressible and deeply unscientific impulse to produce a digital basanos that will extract confessions from the body and that can be deployed on those without the power to consent or refuse. So arguably, this is a form of violence. If someone wants to take something uh, from me, a, a truth about me that I do not uh, freely choose to give, and they take it from my body, is that not a form of violence? But if, if you're not willing to go that far, um, think about the, the legacy that is already connecting these tools with actual physical violence, the use of these tools against Uyghur Muslims in China, the use of tools like this, uh, to uh, falsely imprison uh, Black uh, uh, Americans in, uh, 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 in the uh, criminal uh, justice system in the United States. Uh, we have already had multiple examples of false arrest uh, uh, that are uh, uh, based upon uh, the errors produced uh, by these AI tools. Um, we can think about any number of ways that governments uh, would use tools like this uh, in order uh, to legitimize uh, the uh, uh, violence against uh, people uh, claimed to be uh, to be gay, uh, to be uh, uh, guilty of uh, criminal intentions, uh, to be uh, plotting uh, violence uh, in a in a protest or public event. Uh, so there is literal violence uh, of a physical sort associated with the use of these tools as well. So how do we resist this impulse, and can we purge it from AI's legacy? So this is where I want to make a turn uh, in the talk to uh, Foucault uh, and some, uh, some thoughts that Foucault had at the end of his life about truth and the Bassanos. So I want to uh, talk here about uh, Foucault on uh, parousia. And this is from The Courage of Truth uh, 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 in 1984, uh, part of Foucault's uh, final lectures. In, in, in these lectures, uh, Foucault says um, that uh, parousia is an act or practice of truth telling. And he's going back uh, to uh, the ancient Greeks uh, to describe this practice. Uh, and he uh, describes it as 
uh, a form of telling all without reserve, uh, a way of hiding nothing and saying what is true regardless of the consequences. Uh, he says, uh, parousia necessarily involves assuming uh, personal and political risk. It thus can only be wielded where one can be hurt by others' rejection of your claims and authority, by their anger or withdrawal of friendship and affection, or by a physical attack. So the truth told in parousia, according to Foucault, quote, is the truth subject to risk of violence. But what's interesting here is it's a risk taken by the truth teller themselves. It is a voluntary choice by the speaker to expose themselves to the risk of violence from those to whom he or she is speaking the truth. Um, and it, it is uh, a distinctly power laden uh, form of discourse as well. In the government of self and others from the previous year, Foucault says um, that parousia is in a way a discourse spoken from above which comes from a source higher than the status of the citizen and which is different from the pure and simple exercise of power. Parousia leaves others the freedom to speak and allows freedom to those who have to obey under ordinary circumstances or leaves them free insofar as they will only obey if they can be persuaded. What constitutes parousia is, I think, the exercise of a form of discourse which persuades others whom one commands and which in an agonistic game allows freedom for others who also wish to command. So parousia is a political practice here as it's described initially. So imagine a, 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 an ancient Greek uh, person of considerable political authority who speaks the unvarnished truth to people in a way that is uh, exposing the uh, political leader uh, to the risk of violence uh, from citizens or from the crowd. Um, putting themselves in a position of vulnerability in order to speak the truth, uh, opening themselves up to the possibility of being harmed by this truth telling, uh, even though technically they have the power to compel obedience uh, and surrender by the crowd. But if they choose not to use that force and speak truly and allow the crowd to act as they choose, to respond as they choose, uh, this is uh, the, the practice of parousia. Uh, going back to the courage of truth, uh, Foucault uh, takes uh, a, um, a turn uh, by uh, moving from the practice of political parousia to seeing a new form of parousia, an ethical form uh, in the uh, person of Socrates. So he says in Socrates, uh, we see a shift, a, a, re, uh, a reframing of the practice of parousia uh, as an ethos. Now all parousia given its risk presupposes at least the virtue of courage. Uh, but unlike rhetorical discourse, Socratic parousia is not the exercise of a technical skill, Foucault says, but it's closer to a virtue itself. Its mode of veridiction is not techne, but ethos. He describes ethical parousia as, a, as an essential social role of truth telling that's distinct from that of the prophet, the sage, or the teacher. Unlike the prophet, it speaks uh, directly uh, without uh, obscurity or metaphor or, or riddles. Uh, unlike that of the sage, um, uh, this, the uh, Socratic parousia addresses moral particularities, not just general principles. Uh, and unlike that of the, uh, the teacher who merely seeks to transmit knowledge or instruct, uh, ethical parousia sets the listener a moral task to attend to. This is all uh, from Foucault's analysis. He goes on to say that the subject of ethical parousia is the style of ethical life, or bios. Uh, it's part of a discourse of care, epimelea, care of the self and those within one's care. Like political parousia, however, the problem of who is qualified to exercise this practice remains. Foucault suggests that the qualification is in fact a kind of moral consistency or integrity as embodied in the character of Socrates. In order to have the right to use ethical parousia, you have to live the truth you speak. But to establish this qualification, however, there has to be some sort of test, an examination. And this is where the concept of the Bassanos comes in for Foucault. So he says uh, in the lecture of February 22nd, the examined life involves submitting one's life to what Socrates calls a touchstone, a test, which enables one to distinguish between the good and the bad one has done in life. Socrates is the basanos, the touchstone. 
And by rubbing against him through confrontation with him, one will be able to distinguish between what is good and not good in one's life. One's existence, the form of one's style of existence must be constantly subject to the basanos. It is as basanos, as the person who makes each person justify his life, all his life, and through his life that Socrates is called upon. So here, it is Socrates who is the stone, the torture stone. Socrates, through the philosophical discourse that he invites others to engage in, and which poses some risk to them, right? Some risk of humiliation, uh, some risk of, uh, of being shown to be ignorant. Through this test, uh, a truth can be discerned. So uh, I have some, some philosophical reflections here on this. So going back to AI, I think AI trades upon our desire to escape the labor and risk entailed by truth telling via logos or the construction of reasons. Uh, go back to Aristotle uh, in the beginning of the talk and remember that he wanted to distinguish testimony via basanos from testimony uh, via the logos. I think the technical power of logos can be understood uh, to historically have been uh, 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 protected, reserved for the elite. Those who master logos also necessarily gain the power of rhetoric, the technical skill, uh, uh, not only to persuade, but to lie. So I think it's, it's uh, worth considering that elites in any era have an interest in keeping uh, the construction of truth through reasons as a technology, as a craft for themselves. But this creates a political problem for the elite. The oppressed cannot be made to answer with reasons for they have to be systematically deprived of the power to articulate reasons, to use reasons to tell the truth because reasons can also be used to persuade and to lie. Hence the interest in a pure truth extracted unconsented from the body and uh, preferably in a natural or atechnic form. And I think this dream has been pursued through centuries upon centuries of attempts to perfect the art of torture as Harcourt and Dubois showed from the rack to waterboarding to the 30 hour interrogations that yielded the false confessions uh, of the now exonerated Central Park Five in the United States in the 1980s. I'm arguing that AI today is presenting itself to the elite and to those who secure and defend their power as the latest fulfillment of this dream. And I think this is the height of irony since AI is an exquisitely constructed technology, by definition, an artificial, non-natural mode of knowledge production. So uh, there is nothing about AI that just uh, uh, magically reaches into the body and extracts the truth uh, directly from it in some natural and, um, uh, and uh, unquestionably objective uh, way. Uh, and I think there's another irony here. When it's deployed as a digital bosonos, uh, AI technology is highly opaque, unreliable, and misleading, and has consistently failed the scientific and moral tests to which it is put. There are lots of good uses for AI, lots of scientifically legitimate uh, uh, things uh, that we can discover uh, with it. Uh, but when we are using it as a digital bosonos, we are finding again and again uh, its failure both on scientific and moral grounds. So my question for you is, can AI be untethered from this legacy of violence? Can uses and designers of digital basanoi be subjected to a new kind of test, a Socratic basanos of ethical parousia? Because I think it's interesting to consider the power of technology, for example, social media, uh, which can function as an alternative basonic force and a counterforce. Think about the way that Twitter uh, brings the power and danger of rhetoric and parousia from the elites to the many. Uh, although of course it, it also drowns the truth in a, in a flood of bullshit. Um, but think about the way that Twitter is often used by people uh, to, to extract and make visible uh, the truths uh, 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 and the um, uh, hypocrisies uh, about uh, the statements and actions of elites. Think also about social platforms, which are being used in combination uh, with the smartphone camera to uh, function as a kind of counter basanos, one used uh, to extract unconsented truth, uh, but this time from the bodies of the powerful instead of the bodies of the powerless and oppressed. So think about uh, uh, the use of 
uh, uh, camera phones and uh, social media platforms uh, to document uh, violent police actors or uh, uh, racist uh, uh, and dangerous actions by uh, the Amy Coopers and Barbecue Beckys of the world, if any of you remember those controversies of, of last year. Um, but think about the, uh, uh, the, the recent uh, case uh, uh, in the United States uh, where a police officer uh, was uh, convicted of murder uh, uh, of uh, a black man uh, uh, almost entirely uh, caused uh, by the evidence uh, that had been taken by a, uh, by a young woman, a bystander who would not have been believed as a witness herself, uh, but used uh, her smartphone camera uh, to document what happened. So, uh, so a question I wanna leave us with for the discussion, um, is there a way that um, we, can, we can save AI uh, from uh, this legacy uh, by new practice of, of ethical truth-telling, of parousia? Uh, can we subject AI itself uh, to a kind of Socratic basanos? Uh, this would require that AI system developers be willing to expose their designs to critical testing of their scientific and moral integrity, and that they accept the risk of commercial failure and public rejection. Remember, ethical truth-telling involves exposure to risk of rejection and harm. So can AI system developers tell the truth about their systems, expose their systems to these tests and accept the consequences? We can also ask whether ethical AI like social media could be deployed as a counter basonic force. That is, can it be designed to extract truth from resistant systems of power and make silent forms of oppression speak? And can it be done in ways uh, that unlike the dominant basonic forms are actually scientifically and morally valid. Can AI be designed as a tool of Socratic basanos itself? Can it be used as a way to test our own moral integrity and consistency as a mirror to see if our own styles of living, our bios, reflect the values or ethos we speak? So I'm asking questions about whether AI uh, could be used uh, uh, as uh, a basanos but in ways that are not tainted by this legacy of, of violence. Uh, can, we, can we reform the relationship between AI and truth and power?